Okay, good evening. Good evening and welcome to tonight's special event. I'm, as I said, delighted that everybody's so interested and your interest is well placed. If there's any seat free anywhere, please put up a hand so somebody else can get off the floor and get a seat. I'm not seeing too many. There's actually a few seats up in the very top. So people in the aisle, you jump in over there. Okay, so I welcome you tonight on behalf of the Ohio State University Department of Physics. Our chair, Professor James Beatty, is on a research trip and sends his regrets. I'm John Beacom, and I'm the director of the Center for Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics, which is a joint venture between the Department of Physics and the Department of Astronomy. The Department of Physics hosts world-leading research efforts, provides excellent teaching and mentoring, and is very active at sharing the excitement of physics with the public. One of the ways we do that is through the Alpheus Smith Lectures, which are at tonight. This lecture series is a tribute to one of the early leaders of our department. Professor Alpheus Smith joined the faculty in 1909. He's not still teaching Physics 101, <laughs> despite what you may have heard. He became chair in 1927 and dean of the graduate school in 1938. He retired in 1946, but came back to be president of the OSU Research Foundation. Despite all of that, he lived to be 92 years old. This lecture series was endowed by the Smith family and their friends in 1960. Tonight's talk is the 53rd installment of the series. So raise your hand if you've been to at least five of these talks. That's a lot. Anybody been to at least 10? 20? I'm still seeing hands. 30? John, yeah, there, John Highmaster. How many have you been to? Okay, he's seen almost everyone but one. So this is your chance to begin a great tradition and to come back next year and in future years. So half of the speakers in this series hold a Nobel Prize in physics. However, only one person in this series has been invited twice. And that person is Professor Kip Thorne, tonight's speaker. He last spoke in 1995. He didn't use PowerPoint. He used something called transparencies, which I hope most of you have never seen. Now, Professor Thorne, I gather you may have heard of him because you're here. Professor Thorne, simply put, is one of the world's experts in gravity, general relativity, and gravitational waves. Despite the fact that he's a theorist, he was one of the initial members to found the LIGO Gravitational wa uh, Wave Observatory, the most sensitive detector of its kind in the world. He mentored 52 PhD students, which means he read at least 52 theses, which is really a task. He wrote well-received technical and popular books, and he's been recognized by numerous, way too many to list, national and international awards. His faculty career was spent at the California Institute of Technology, which you may have heard of, where he is now the Feynman Professor of Theoretical Physics Emeritus. Not only does he know Sheldon Cooper, he hired Sheldon Cooper. <laughs> in the past several years, he's begun new projects, now in arts and entertainment. He co-authored the treatment for a popular movie. Many people do that. But his got turned into a movie, and he was the science advisor and an executive producer. That movie was Interstellar. They had a box office return of $675 million. Now, every physics book ever written in the history of humanity makes a little bit of money. And if you add all of that up, it's much, much less. <laughs> so I think Kip has figured out something that we have. So please give a well, warm welcome to Professor Kip Thorne. Thank you for that overly generous introduction. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Good. So, Next Wednesday, seven days from today, will be the 100th anniversary of the lecture that Albert Einstein gave at the Prussian Academy of Sciences in Berlin, uh, presenting to the world his general theory of relativity. And I have the honor to have been invited to give a public lecture on that date next Wednesday in Berlin at the location where he did this. And the lecture I'm giving to you is a dry run. 
You didn't know this when you invited me, but uh, uh, I hope you like it, uh, and I hope they like it. Uh, I'm going to be talking then about the centennial of Einstein's relativity, but I'll be focusing on black holes, gravitational waves, and I will use the movie Interstellar to illustrate uh, a number of the concepts in re general relativity. So I'm going to have a preamble and a prologue to this lecture. The preamble is just a bit about the movie Interstellar because it's going to play a role through the movie, through, throughout the lecture. Uh, Interstellar was started by Linda Oakes and me. She's an ex-girlfriend of mine. When you live in uh, Pasadena and you're single, you date in Hollywood. And, uh, the Carl Sagan set us up with a blind date and the romance never went anywhere. We became good friends. Last weekend, uh, she, Linda, and my wife, and I went to see The Martian together. Uh, and so that's the kind of friendship it is. But in 2005, she uh, called me up and said, would you like to brainstorm with me for a, a science fiction movie? And I thought about it for a few milliseconds and then said yes. And uh, Interstellar is the result. Uh, Linda brought on Jonah Nolan. Jonathan Nolan is his official name, jo known as Jonah to his friends to write the screenplay. And then uh, later, his brother, Christopher Nolan, joined us as the second screenwriter and as the director of the movie. The Nolan brothers completely changed the story that Linda and I began with. They did not change the science. And jointly with the Nolan brothers, I added a bunch more science. So the science vision of the movie is unchanged, but the story is theirs and the credit for this movie really belongs to them. Uh, but I feel great pleasure in having been so intimately involved and having been given the opportunity to ensure that general relativity physics is embedded in this fabric of this movie from the outset and very, very deeply and uh, correct physics. Uh, so Chris introduced me to Paul Franklin, who is the uh, supervisor uh, for visual effects. And Paul and uh, I and his team worked together to make sure that the images that you see of black holes and wormholes and accretion disks of hot gas around black holes are all precisely what you would see if you up, were up close to them uh, and carrying an IMAX camera. And we did this by uh, solving the equations for propagation of light from the source of light, say a hot disk of gas or a nebula or a star, through the warped space-time of the black hole or the wormhole to the IMAX camera. And then in the IMAX camera, assuring that you had the correct amount of scattering of light in the IMAX camera to assure that this is what you would see with an IMAX camera, not with a human eye. And so uh, this is the real thing. And I will uh, come back to that when I talk about black holes and wormholes. Uh, Paul Franklin got the Academy Award for Best Visual Effects uh, in any movie in uh, 2015 for the visual effects that uh, uh, appeared in this movie. Much of it uh, basically because of the work that we did jointly together. Now, so I've told you a little bit about the people I worked with on the film. I'm going to let you listen to them talk about me to so get some sense that this was a true collaboration. We're still pioneers. We've barely begun. Our greatest accomplishments cannot be behind us. Because our destiny lies above us. The initial emphasis for the project would be to say, why not examine real possibilities? Why not actually look at the real science there? Luckily, we had Kip, and Kip is the foremost authority on all things gravitational. The warping of space inside here scatters some of the back, black scattering off of the surface of the ripple ocean. Neither wormholes nor black holes have been depicted in any Hollywood movie in the way that they actually would appear. This is the first time the depiction began with Einstein general relativity equations. The visual effects department under Paul Franklin and everybody at Double Negative took Kip's mathematical data and they created real visual representations of what a black hole is meant to look like. The collaboration has produced 
visualization of things which nobody had ever managed to do before. You know, we potentially may have discovered a couple of new things that were lurking there inside the mathematics, inside the physics. I worked out the equations that would enable him to do the gravitational lensing. And so you have light that comes from the star behind the black hole. It may come in, go around the black hole several times, and then come to the camera. And so you wind up with uh, several different images of the star. The black hole warps the space so much, it just looks like you're looking at a strange sort of full sky with this intensely black circle in the middle of it. But the gravity of the black hole draws in all the matter from the surrounding universe. And this spins out into a giant disk around the central sphere. And as it whirls in towards the center, the gas gets hotter and hotter. And this thing, the accretion disk around it, shines brilliantly. And then we found that if you then render this whole thing, you visualize it all through this extraordinary gravitational lens, the gravity twists this glowing disk of gas into weird shapes, and you get this extraordinary sort of rainbow of fire across the top of the black hole. And I saw this disk wrap up over the black hole and under the black hole. And I'd known it intellectually, but knowing it intellectually is completely different than seeing it, than feeling it. We had determined when we started down this road that if it didn't look like something that would be comprehensible to the audience, we would have to manipulate it in some way. But what we found was, as long as we didn't change the point of view too much of the camera position, we could get some very understandable tactile art imagery from those equations. They were constantly surprising. You know, spoke to a maximum that the truth could be stranger than fiction. We're going to write several technical papers about this. One aimed at the astrophysics community, and then something for the, the computer graphics community, saying, here are some things that we've discovered about gravitational lensing by rapidly spinning black holes that we never knew before. So this collaboration isn't over until we've given some sense of the things that we've learned. So we did write those technical papers. Uh, one is uh, in a journal called Classical and Quantum Gravity, and it uh, explains how, in very technical terms, how we did the simulations, techniques we invented in order to do the simulations properly, and uh, then describes the discoveries we made about black holes uh, using the computer code that uh, Paul Franklin's team wrote based on the equations I gave to them. So it's been a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, I can tell you that the number of downloads of this paper in classical quantum gravity that there have been is far, far more than any other paper ever published in that journal before. <laughs> and uh, you can guess that most of those downloads were not from astrophysicists. But anyway, so it's been a wonderful collaboration. And let me now go on to the prologue, which I entitle Einstein's Audacity. And this is the story leading up to his formulation of general relativity. So, Newton and Einstein. In the period 1643 to 1727 was Newton's life. And uh, during his life, he developed for us, gave us a framework for the laws of nature that has lasted thereafter for 200 years. A framework based on the concept of absolute space and absolute time, forces, accelerations, and the things of everyday experience. Albert Einstein. 110 years ago, this is not yet general relativity, it's what's called special relativity. He gave us a new framework for all the laws of physics called the, that's based on the principle of relativity that says that all the laws of nature must be the same in every freely moving laboratory everywhere in the universe. And if you look at this and think about it, you will recognize that this is a law that governs all the laws of physics. That is really took a lot of courage for Einstein to be able to pro propound, to present to us a law that governs all the laws of physics. And it is uh, uh, profoundly deep. And uh, thus far, as far as we can tell, he was absolutely right. So this has weird consequences. If I measure the speed of light, one looking at a light beam that goes running past me, and I get the usual result, which is roughly 300,000 kilometers per second. And if you're moving past me at a speed of 200,000 kilometers per second, then you would think that you would measure the speed for that same light beam that's 300,000 minus 200,000, which is 100,000 kilometers per second. But Einstein's principle of relativity says, no, you'll measure the same speed for that same light beam as I measure which seems absolutely puzzling. How could 
you be moving at nearly the speed of light relative to me, and yet we measure the same speed for that same light beam. Something weird must be going on. How is this possible? Well, Einstein told us how it's possible. He said that you and I will disagree about the lengths of things. We'll disagree about time and how much time it takes for the light beam to travel. We will disagree about what events that occur, such as the firing of two firecrackers, are simultaneous and what events are not simultaneous. Uh, and he gave us precise uh, formulas for those disagreements that work out in such a way that we all agree on the speed of light. And we all agree if we do experiments in our own laboratory on the laws of physics. It's really remarkable uh, uh, prediction and a, no, a remarkable amount of courage to call Newton's ideas into question. And then he went beyond that. He said, OK, now Newton has told us about gravity. Newton tells us that uh, if we want to know the force of the uh, sun's gravity on the Earth, uh, that we should measure the separation between the sun and the earth at some particular moment of time using simultaneity that Newton thought was absolute. And then the force will be proportional to 1 over the square of the distance between the earth and the sun at that moment of time. But Einstein looked at that and he says, well, the separation d, it's different as measured by the sun and by the uh, earth because they're moving relative to each other. And instantaneous, or simultaneity, is different as measured by the sun and the earth. And so uh, this Newton's law of gravity makes no sense. And uh, so he then had the courage to say that Newton's law of gravity violates my principle of relativity. Therefore, Newton must be wrong, because I'm <laughs> obviously right. And so that was uh, Einstein's chutzpah, I would say, uh, having a Jewish wife. Uh, that, that was Einstein's. Uh, uh, arrogance, and Einstein has turned out to be correct, and Newton was wrong. Newton and Einstein are said, or agreed, I think, by all physicists to have been the two greatest physicists of all time, and there's all, it's often debated who is greater of the two. I tend to think that Einstein was the greater of the two, and it's remarkable that he lived in my era. I was still growing up when he passed away in the early 1950s, but that I overlapped him is uh, really remarkable. Okay, so now let me move on. So what did uh, Einstein give to us for a description of gravity? Having said that Newton was wrong, he had to go back to square run. And he formulated, actually in 1912, a, as a first step toward his general relativity theory about warp space and time, he formulated something that I like to call Einstein's law of time warps. And what this says is that things like to live where they will age the most slowly. And isn't that where you want to live? <laughs> And gravity pulls them there. And he gave us a precise formula that says that the amount of slowing of time, then, on the surface of the Earth uh, is determined by the strength of gravity that we have on the surface of the Earth. He said, then, that on Earth, because by measuring the strength of gravity on Earth, he could conclude that on Earth, time slows by one second in 100 years. So you're not going to gain very much in terms of slow aging uh, by living on Earth. But one second in 100 years is the right amount to uh, co correspond to the strength of gravity that we experience. And that was tested for the first time with very high precision by flying an atomic clock in a rocket up to high altitude. In 1976, it was tested to 0.1 one one-hundredth of 1 percent, or one part in 10,000, was found to agree with precisely with, the, with Einstein's predictions. So what this says is that the Earth's mass warps time, and this time warp produces the gravity that we feel, which is so radically different from Newton's description of gravity that uh, you would hardly think they were talking about the same thing. But they agree to very high accuracy in the solar system. <coughs> but near a black hole, where gravity is enormously stronger, such as the black hole Gargantua, in the movie Interstellar, time will slow enormously more. And so in fact, in the movie Interstellar, there is a planet called Miller's Planet that's orbiting very close to the uh, surface, or the so-called event horizon of uh, the black hole Gargantua. And one hour on Miller's Planet is seven years on Earth, which is really quite remarkable, an enormous amount of slowing. And this is what is predicted uh, for a uh, a uh, black hole, for a, 
a planet orbiting sufficiently close to the horizon of a black hole. And of course, in the movie Interstellar, this is the basis for the emotional, a very emotional part of the film. Cooper, played by Matthew McConaughey, he uh, uh, is with his uh, ten-year-old daughter uh, before he goes on a trip that takes him close to the uh, black, takes him to the surface of the uh, of the planet uh, Miller's planet, close to the black hole Gargantua. He tells her he's going to be near a black hole, and he may be there long enough that by the time he comes back, she will have grown to be as old as he is now grown from age 20 to uh, something in her 30s. And that, in fact, happens when he emerges from the vicinity of Gargantua. She has grown up to become a brilliant theoretical physicist. That's one of the things I like about this movie. You have Jessica Chastain playing a theoretical physicist like me. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and I'll tell you a bit more. Another nice thing, uh, on the red carpet in Hollywood, uh, the world premiere of the film, she talked about working with me on the equations uh, that she dealt with in the movie and how, what, how wonderful it was to work with Kip Thorne, the theoretical physicist. So, so uh, there was a certain mutual admiration uh, between them. <laughs> <laughs> and then Hooper goes down near the black hole again, and his daughter Murphy becomes a very old woman in her 90s, and he has changed hardly at all in the course of the movie. And this is a very emotional moment when he goes back and meets his daughter, who is now very, very old. And she's surrounded by her grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And uh, there he is, uh, still in his 30s, uh, uh, meeting with his, his aged daughter. So 100 million people who saw this movie uh, have experienced, in an emotional sort of a way, Einstein's law of time warp. They've experienced the slowing of time uh, that is predicted by general relativity. In 1912, Einstein realized that if time is warped, then space must also be warped. And, uh, and so if you look at uh, that prediction, it says that uh, it was tested once again around 1976 uh, with high precision for the first time, really high precision for the first time. Uh, the, uh, Robert Riesenberg and Erwin Shapiro, in an experiment conceived by Erwin, who was a professor at MIT at the time, is now at Harvard, uh, they uh, transmitted radio signals out to the Viking spacecraft, which was in orbit around Mars at the time, being carried by Mars around in Mars' orbit. And the Viking spacecraft uh, received those signals and transmitted them back to Earth and uh, Riesenberg and Shapiro monitored the round trip travel time. And uh, they had a prediction for how that should have behaved as the Viking spacecraft moved in its orbit if space is not warped. But it took longer for those signals to make the round trip uh, than the prediction of space is flat, longer by an amount that became greater and greater and greater as the uh, radio beam got closer and closer to the sun. So it was obvious that the uh, radio beam was traveling longer than it would have done if had space been flat in here. And from the observational data, they could map out the shape of space there. And they mapped it out by thinking about what this looks like, the space along the uh, path of the light rays in the orbital plane of uh, Mars. Uh, mapping out what it would look like is seen by some being hypothetical intelligent being that lives in a higher dimension in which our universe is warped. And so it looks like this. We call that higher dimension the bulk or hyperspace. And uh, some so-called bulk being looking in from the bulk would see our universe or in the vicinity of the sun bent down in the bulk like this so that the distance of propagation of those radio waves is increased. And they could map out precisely what that shape would be around the sun, and then it could be compared with predictions of general relativity, uh, Einstein's predictions, and agreed right on, again to a precision of about a part in 10,000. This was really, really a remarkable experiment, again verifying Einstein's predictions. From 1912 to 1915, Einstein struggled to discover the precise mathematical law, which means the equation. The equations are the math and mathematics are the language of uh, the laws of physics. 
discover the equation that governs the warping of space and time. Uh, and he got it, as I told you, November 25th, 1915. He presented it in Berlin to the world. He says, space and time are warped by mass and energy that live in space-time. Even your mass warps space-time a little bit. Uh, and he gave us the Einstein field equation, uh, which is, uh, looks like gobbledygook to you. Uh, and, but if you study the underlying mathematics for a few years, you can come to grips with it, pick it apart, and figure out precisely what it is saying and start making the kinds of predictions that Einstein was making and that uh, physicists have made ever since. This warping that uh, is predicted by Einstein's field equation controls then the motion of stars, the motions of spacecraft, the propagation of light, and everything else uh, that experiences gravity in our universe. And so the rest of my talk is going to focus on what Einstein's equation has taught us in the past century. And I'm going to begin with black holes. And I'll begin with a brief history of black holes. I'm going to make, name some names that are not going to mean anything to you, but what I want to get across, I just wrote the names down uh, just for completeness. What I want to get across is an a idea that will become more and more clear as I go down this list. 1916, using Einstein's field equation, a guy named uh, Carl Schwarzschild, an astrophysicist, discovered the formula that describes a black hole, but he didn't understand it. He didn't understand what a black hole was. He didn't understand what he had, but he had the formula. 1939, there was a lot of intervening stuff. These are just the highlights. Einstein looked at that formula. He misunderstood it. He published a paper saying, I don't believe you can ever get down to what we now recognize as the horizon of the black hole. Uh, you can never go there. Uh, that region down there that we now recognize as the horizon and the interior of the black hole is unphysical. It has nothing to do with the real world. Then he ate crow uh, a little bit later. Uh, he was wrong. 1939, Robert Oppenheimer, who would go on to lead the American Atomic Bomb Project at Los Alamos several years later, and a student named Hartland Snyder, who had spent his younger years as a truck driver in Utah, and then got interested in physics and went to Berkeley and studied under Oppenheimer. Uh, Oppenheimer and Snyder solved Einstein's <coughs> equation uh, to get the formula describing a star that implodes to form a black hole. But they didn't understand what they had. They partially understood it. But it, it was, you read the paper, and it's kind of muddle-headed uh, uh, with hindsight of a half a century. Uh, they just did not understand very clearly what was going on. And things really only gets, got fully sorted out in terms of the physics and what is happening as we, in the manner that we now understand it about black holes in the 1950s and 60s uh, due to the guys named Finkelstein, Kruskal, and Wheeler. Wheeler was my personal mentor as a graduate student. 1965, Roy Kerr, a New Zealander mathematician, discovered the formula that describes a spinning black hole. And it turned out the original black hole was not spinning. And a whole new set of phenomena uh, arose from that formula. And in the 1960s and 70s became the golden age of black hole research when Stephen Hawking and others uh, sorted out all the implications uh, for the physics of black holes and observational evidence for black holes started to come in. You notice this is a half a century from the first formula for a black hole until people began to understand and until observational data began to roll in. It took a long time. Uh, because this was really hard, and the technology for observations wasn't there until uh, much later than the 1960s. So what we now understand from that, what uh, Wheeler and uh, others came to understand in the 1950s and 60s, is this, that if we look at the shape of space as seen from the bulk, by a bulk being looking in from the bulk, uh, to, in order to visualize the shape of space, Around a black hole, it looks precisely like this. This goes out and becomes flat as you go out into the external universe toward Earth. And it bends down in this manner. Uh, and this is for a non-spinning black hole. For a fast-spinning black hole, it looks like that. Much deeper throat down here. The color coding indicates the slowing of time. Where it's yellow, time is slowing at 10% of the rate that it is back on Earth. Where it's black, time is slowed to a halt. And according to Einstein's law of time warp, at that location, the bottom of this diagram, 
uh, then gravity has to be infinitely strong, and so nothing can get out. Because time is slow to a halt, infinite gravity, nothing can get out. That's the surface of the black hole, the so-called event horizon. And then the fast-spinning black hole drags space into whirling motion fast near the horizon, <coughs> slower farther away. These white arrows have a length that's proportional to the angular velocity of spin of space around the black hole. And so those are the three aspects of the warping of space-time. A warping of space, a slowing of time, and a whirling motion of space like the air in a tornado. And that's how black holes behave uh, when they're quiescent black holes, like the black hole Gargantua. And this, again, is seen by a bulk being. But that's not the way we see it, because we live on that surface. That surface, that deformed surface, uh, is our universe in the vicinity of the black hole, bent down in the bulk in the hyper. And so for interstellar, and uh, independently a little earlier, other astrophysicists had done this, we had to take the light from a star, propagate it along light rays to the IMAX camera. And if you have an IMAX camera here and a non-spinning black hole horizon down there, there are two light rays that lead uh, from the star to the camera, this one and that one. And so you see two images of that star here and there. And then there's a shadow of the black hole. You can't get any light from the star or from any other stars inside that shadow. The shadow just looks like a black sphere. So it's obvious that you, you can see it. It's a black hole. It's, it's, a, black, it's a black hole shadow. Uh, and so this is called gravitational lensing because it's like sending light uh, through a, distort, a, a spatially distorting lens and making some funny shape, to, a shape out of yourself, make you, making a selfie with a distorted lens. Well, it's called uh, gravitational lens. So uh, Christopher Nolan and I <coughs> discussed this. As I said, he introduced me to Paul Franklin. Paul introduced me to Oliver James and Eugenie von Tunzelman. Eugenie von Tunzelman then was responsible for producing an image of the accretion disk around the black hole of what it would look like if space and time were not warped. I gave the equations for light propagation uh, around the black hole to Oliver James. He programmed the equations in a language called C++ uh, and ran a huge supercomputer that belongs to the double negative computer graphics folks. Uh, these are the folks that uh, they have a thousand employees in London, uh, two or three hundred in Singapore, and they do the computer graphics for the Harry Potter movies, for all of Christopher Nolan's movies, and a lot of other things that you have seen. And so that gave rise uh, to the Academy Award <laughs> for Paul for the best visual effects of 2015. Uh, and uh, we took uh, both before we started building the images for Interstellar and then in much greater detail afterwards, we used Oliver James's computer code to explore gravitational lensing if instead of having a hot disk of gas around the black hole, you have stars. Uh, uh, a star field, and the camera is orbiting around the black hole. And this is the basis for the technical discoveries that we made. And I'm just going to show you uh, this film clip that, uh, that uh, my collaborators then at Double Negative made. Uh, every star uh, actually has 14 <coughs> images in here. Multi not just two images, but 14 images that we were able to find. And we know, in fact, that there are an infinite number of images of every star, but most of them congregated right along the edge of the shadow. If you look carefully down here, you will see where there was initially no image. Suddenly, an image will appear, and it's really two stellar images appearing simultaneously on top of each other, and then they split apart. And where there were no images there, there are two images of a star that already had a bunch of other images elsewhere. And if you follow the motion of one of those images, you will see it annihilate with another image uh, somewhere else. And so images are being continually created and annihilated uh, in pairs uh, in a phenomenon that is due to what are called caustics of the past light cone of the IMAX camera. So that's physics jargon. Uh, but uh, there's beautiful mathematics underlying this. And we had the pleasure of sorting it out here for this IMAX camera that just appears here. So if you look, keep your eye down in here, and you'll see image <coughs> subject here, in here. There it went, and it's splitting apart into two.
two. You'll see another one down here momentarily. Um, <coughs> there it is. And then if you follow these images, they'll annihilate with some other image further along. So this is really fun to do, fun to make some physics discoveries with a Hollywood uh, uh, computer program that's been written to make a movie. Here's what you see in the movie. It doesn't look at all like that. This is the iconic image of the black hole Gargantua. And uh, this has become the iconic image for black holes with accretion disks around them. That it nowadays is actually used by astrophysicists to motivate their, uh, the public about how interesting their research is. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll explain that in just a moment. Uh, but so you ask, why is that image the way it is? That doesn't look like any black hole that you ever saw before interstellar. But this is the truth. The black images of black holes you saw in the Disney movie, The Black Hole, have nothing to do with reality. This is the real thing. And it's very simple. There's a disk of hot gas, sort of like Saturn's rings, around this black hole Gargantua. And you have your IMAX camera there, just a little bit above the plane of this thin accretion disk. And a light ray coming off the top back face of this disk, by the warp space and time around the black hole, it is bent and goes down to the camera. And so the camera thinks that the top back face of this disk is up here. And so that's the piece of the image that is generated by the top back face of the disk. A light ray coming off the bottom back face is bent up to the camera. So the camera thinks that bottom back face is down there. The disk has been, looks like the disk has been split apart and the top of it's been gone up here and the bottom's gone down there. That explains the bottom part of the image. And then light rays from the front of the accretion disk go directly to the camera and that explains this uh, piece of the uh, image that, uh, of the accretion disk going across in front of the black hole. So a very simple explanation, but really quite beautiful to see this in reality coming out of the simulations. And I had not, uh, I, had, I had had seen something similar to this many, many years earlier, done by a, a guy named uh, uh, Luminet in France, but I'd forgotten about it. And when I saw it here uh, on the screen uh, after my collaborators uh, made the image, I, it was just so so exciting to see, and so, so moving. From the observational data that you uh, see in the, black hole, in the movie Interstellar, and I go into this in my book about the science of interstellar, you can infer that the black hole is spinning very rapidly. Uh, you can also infer that it weighs 100 million times more than the sun weighs. And the black hole's circumference is about the same as the Earth's orbit around the sun. Now, that's a big black hole. It's not the biggest black hole that exists in the universe. It's the same size as the black hole that is at the center of the galaxy Andromeda, which is the nearest large galaxy to our own, one that you often see uh, off your telescope pictures of. It has a black hole that has this size uh, and this mass at its center. So where do these accretion disks come from? They come, they're created when a black hole tears a star apart. And I'm going to show you now a simulation uh, by two young astrophysicists, James Guyacon and Subi Ajiza, uh, a simulation that they did uh, of a star that go, swings near a black, giant black hole like this and is torn apart by the gravity of the black hole by what are called tidal gravitational forces. Uh, the black hole is sitting up here in this corner. You probably can't see it. It's a little blue dot. Uh, the initial action occurs in this square, and then it's going to spread over the whole screen. Uh, and the, uh, the star is going to go in and whip around the black hole. It'll be torn, torn apart, and then you start seeing the gas that's torn off the star. So let's let it go. Here the star goes in. There you have a big stream of gas that's torn off. People here who can't see the screen, why don't you move out far enough that you can see it? There's no, no reason you have to be mesmerized by my back. <laughs> anyway, so the gas swings back in a big jet, and uh, then some of it uh, goes down and forms the accretion disk around the black hole. The rest of it just goes flying away out into interstellar space. And so that's where accretion disks come from. 
There is a big black hole, not as big as Gargantua, in the center of our own galaxy. It has been weighed uh, by uh, Andrea Ghez at uh, UCLA and her team by measuring the orbits of stars around it. So the black hole is sitting down in here. And you can, these are the orbits of stars. And you can watch the stars go in. They whip around the black hole on these orbits. And you can identify where the black hole is by the focus of where the whipping around is. And uh, by applying <coughs> Kepler's laws to the orbital motion, she was able to measure how heavy this black hole is. It's 4 million times the mass of the sun. So it's uh, 25 times smaller than Gargantua in its mass and the circumference, and 25 times smaller than the one in our twin galaxy, Andromeda. Why we have a little black hole? Well, little as these things go. And Andromeda has a giant one. It's not uh, really completely clear, but that, that's the way it is. What are the prospects to actually see an accretion disk and the shadow of a black hole? Well, the best prospects are for the black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And uh, there is something called the Event Horizon Telescope that is basically a network of radio <coughs> telescopes around the Earth that uh, is networked together to try to collect data, common data, and the data are processed in order to try to make an image of the black hole and its accretion disk at the cent center of our uh, galaxy. Uh, this is a collaboration of hundreds of radio astronomers from 34 universities and institutes I have, including I gave this, used this slide once before in Taiwan, and so they have an involvement in this. I don't know whether Ohio State has an involvement or not. It's, uh, but uh, a number of universities and institutes. And success is actually likely in this decade. You can read about it uh, on the web at that location. And it's really remarkable that we are close to being able to actually make images for this black hole like the image that you see in, uh, uh, in the movie Interstellar. Now, black holes are weird, as is illustrated by properties of Miller's planet. Miller's planet, you remember, is down near the surface of the black hole. One hour on Miller's planet is seven years on Earth. And uh, Christopher Nolan uh, said to me on one of our first meetings, I want one uh, hour on Miller's planet to be seven years back on Earth. I told him I don't think that's possible. Uh, he said, go do a real calculation. I've seen you be wrong before. <laughs> so I went home overnight. I did a real calculation and came back amazed that he was right. Uh, I was right, if the black hole didn't spin, you can't get the uh, planet any closer than this or it will fall in. And you can only have one hour is 90 minutes back on Earth. But if the black hole spins fast enough, it turns out that the whirling of space in the vicinity of the black hole stabilizes the orbit so the, black, so the planet can be close, to, close enough to the horizon that one hour in seven years is possible. So it requires that this uh, black hole spin very, very, very fast. There's a maximum spin any black hole can have. And this is uh, 14 nines, 0 0.14 nines, uh, smaller than the maximum possible spin. This is not astrophysically very plausible, because it's awfully easy to spin a black hole down when it is spinning that fast. But it's allowed by the laws of physics. If you were a very advanced civilization, you could protect the black hole from spinning down, and you could actually get it to uh, be uh, uh, spinning this fast. So the name of the game in this business with uh, Christopher Nolan was, if, uh, if the laws of physics allow it, then we can use it. And so, <laughs> so we did. In the movie, you see one kilometer high waves. And I'm going to show you a film clip of that. How long for the engine's case? A minute or two. Well, we don't have it. Come on, on. <coughs> Bring it. Close up. You're up. Case, load the cabin oxygen through the main thrusters. We're going to spark it. Go to this. Lock. Depressurize it. <laughs> That's a remarkable sequence, and that's an awfully big wave. 
And it's interesting that the wave doesn't break. You're accustomed to any big tall wave, they're going to start to break. This is actually what's called a solitary wave, or a soliton. They don't break, but they require that the water be very deep where they are, as, uh, roughly as deep as the wave is high. That's not the case where uh, Cooper and his crew have landed. They have, must have landed on sort of a submerged mountain uh, that's in a much deeper, deeper water. And so then you can get this as the, this wave comes in and crashes over them. Uh, what causes the wave? I can understand what causes the wave by knowing that there's about one wave every hour. And, I have all, uh, and so if there's one wave every hour, there's a simple explanation, well, relatively simple. Uh, so uh, the gargantua is near the horizon of the black hole. This side of gargantua is closer to the horizon than that side. So the gravitational pull on this side is higher than on that side. And this is called a tidal gravitational force because it stretches the planet. Uh, the uh, average gravitational force is counteracted by centrifugal forces so that uh, the planet is freely moving just like an astronaut in, a, in, the, in the space station can float even though the pull of the Earth's gravity is n not much weaker up there than it is down here. But the centrifugal force associated with the motion of the spacecraft around the Earth counterbalances the pull of the, uh, of the Earth on the astronaut. And so the astronaut floats freely, the planet floats freely in its orbit, but gets distorted. And it is precisely that same effect that leads to the tides on the ocean. The tidal force in the case of the ocean is produced by the moon and the sun and not produced by a black hole. But it's the same tidal force, but just produced by the black hole gargantua, and enormously bigger, big enough to significantly deform the planet itself. Now, this planet, like the moon, keeps the same face toward uh, the, the attracting uh, uh, gravitational body. The moon keeps the same face toward the Earth. Uh, uh, this planet keeps the same face toward Gargantua. It's uh, locked into that by the tidal forces themselves. But it, this planet just fairly recently arrived there, deposited there by a gravitational slingshot, presumably, off of another body. Uh, and so it's actually, uh, it is actually rocking back and forth under what we call the restoring force of these tidal forces. As, as it rocks back and forth, and the rocking period is one hour. I computed it. It's one hour for, uh, based on what the observations that we have of what's going on with, the, uh, with this planet, other observations. Uh, that rocking period is one hour, and so clearly what's happening is the water on the oceans uh, of uh, the planet is sloshing back and forth, just simple sloshing. We call this a tidal bore on Earth. You see this kind of sloshing as the tides rise and fall on rivers uh, uh, in places like Nova Scotia and in China on certain rivers. You see a wall of water run up the river uh, when the tide rises. So this is a tidal bore in the form of sloshing of water uh, caused by the rocking of the planet under the tidal force of the black hole. So this illustrates some really interesting physics that you see underlying that, that giant water wave. And the water wave is high because the tidal force of Gargantua is enormously bigger than the tidal force of the moon and the sun on Earth. Let me talk about the insides of black holes. Inside of black holes, there are things called singularities that are governed by something called quantum gravity. And so this is now beginning to go beyond Einstein into the next phase of understanding uh, gravity uh, after Einstein here. And so I'm going to do this step by step. I've already told you that uh, if you're at the event horizon, that time slows to a halt. That whole slow, but the flow, rate of flow of time depends not only on where you are, but how fast you move. When I said it flow, slows to a halt, it's if you're hovering at the event horizon, then it slows to a halt. And so the question is, what happens inside the event horizon? What can be slower than stopped time? And it turns out that what happens is time inside the horizon flows in a direction you would have thought was a space direction downward toward singularities that exist inside the black hole. And that's another reason why nothing can get out of the black hole. 
Nothing can flow backward against the flow of time. It may be possible to make time machines go backward in time, but you can't do it by going backward against the flow of time where you're located. You can only do it by going out in space, always moving forward with your local flow of time, but somehow coming back and arriving uh, before you left as measured by time at the place to where you started. So this is a weird aspect that we know that much about time travel. We don't know whether you can go backward in time, but you can never go backward against the local flow of time. It flows like a river that is flowing so fast that there is no possibility for you to paddle upstream, uh, no matter what technique you use. So time is flowing down away from the horizon. Nothing can get out. Everything is dragged with time downward. And in this movie, Cooper and the robot TARS plunge into Gargantua because they want to uh, learn the laws of quantum gravity that I will comment on in a few minutes. And they know that the only place they can get observational data about those laws is at a singularity inside the black hole. And they desperately need this in order to save the human race. And so that's the, sort of the story of what goes on in the movie. Many of you have seen the movie, and I won't go into detail. But I do want to show you them plunging into the black hole gargantua. Again, this is what you would see as you plunge in. Uh, Cooper is going to tell you where he is. He'll say, I'm approaching the event horizon. I have crossed the event horizon. And then you're going to look back, and you're going to see the universe up above you, even though you're inside the black hole, even though nothing can get out of the black hole, no light or anything. Light can come down into the black hole and carry an image of the external universe. Uh, to Cooper, and you see this in the film, again, based on solving uh, the equation for propagation of light around in, in a black hole. You look back, you see the accretion disk, the ring of the accretion disk. You notice the external universe, the nebulae and stars are inside the disk now, and the black hole is outside the disk. So you wonder what has happened. Well, it's very simple. Uh, let's suppose that the black hole is, is down there, and we're falling down toward the black hole. Uh, and initially, you see the disk uh, like that below you. You go through the disk down into the black hole. Cooper goes through. Uh, and so uh, you're now down inside the black hole. And, uh, and so, so the disk has gone around you and up like that. And the external universe is still on the same side of the disk as it was. But the disk has now shrunk due to your motion away from the external universe, the Doppler shift. It has shrunk. Uh, also, relativistic aberration it has shrunk. And so now uh, you're seeing the external universe uh, uh, occupying uh, the interior of the disk because the disk, as seen by you, has moved around you up and has shrunk. And so this is what it would really look like if you fall into a black hole and looking back up at the external universe. Now, inside Gargantua, and this is a diagram as seen by the bulk beings again, uh, hypothetical beings that live in a higher in the higher dimension, in the bulk. Uh, the shape of space looks like that. And then down at the bottom, there's something very chaotic that I've just drawn a heuristic picture in order to give some sense of it. And what happens is if you fall down in here, you get stretched and squeezed in a chaotic manner. With a stretch and squeeze, it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger until you're torn apart. And then the atoms your body is made of get stretched and squeezed until they're torn apart. And uh, matter is, uh, according to general relativity, matter is destroyed in there, <coughs> gone. In what, uh, in general relativity, we call a singularity. Now, that can't really happen. And so you look more closely at the laws of physics, and you realize that quantum theory intervenes, and that that singularity is actually governed by the laws of quantum gravity. A new uh, description of gravity beyond Einstein that Theoretical physicists are struggling to understand, 
Uh, the most uh, popular and perhaps promising approach to this is what is called string theory or M theory. There are other approaches that also have some promise, so, such as uh, so-called loop quantum gravity. But this is uh, the big sort of uh, golden ring for theoretical physics, trying to understand these laws of quantum gravity. And this is what Professor Brand and Murph, Murphy, Cooper's daughter, need to uh, know in, uh, for reasons that I explain in my book about uh, the science of interstellar, need to know in order to be able to save the human race. Uh, this is, as I say, is some, likely some variant of string theory. It's been a holy grail of theoretical physics since 1960. Uh, these laws control singularities inside black holes. They control the birth of our universe. They uh, control whether or not time machines self-destruct when you try to activate them. There's uh, strong evidence that the time machine will always self-destruct when you try to activate it. But we don't know for sure that's controlled by the laws of quantum gravity. So we would like to know these laws uh, for these kinds of reasons, but uh, Murph needs to know these laws to save the human race. So uh, Tars and Cooper make observations of the singularity, uh, but of course the problem is they are going to die uh, and not be able to get the information out. Fortunately, uh, just before I started working on this movie with, uh, with uh, Christopher Nolan, a, uh, Donald Moralf at the University of California at Santa Barbara and Amos Ori uh, at the Technion in Israel discovered that there is another singularity inside the black hole called an outgoing singularity. A little earlier, Eric Poisson and Werner Israel in the University of Alberta had discovered an infalling singularity. There are really three singularities inside a black hole. And these other two are much more gentle. I'm not going to go into the details of uh, the origin of the singularity, just to tell you that uh, this vicious singularity turns out not to be the final story. There are other more gentle singularities that uh, Cooper might possibly survive if he hits them. And this is very recent uh, relativity research. But I will tell you this much. Uh, this outflying singularity that he actually hits, what it's caused by is all, everything that fell into the black hole over the last million years since the black hole was born, a little bit of it gets scattered back, like light scattering off of fog, uh, off of water uh, droplets in fog. It gets scattered back and goes up toward Cooper. But time is so slowed in there that a million years worth of stuff scattered back hits him in a fraction of a second. And it hits him so fast that although it seems to be lethal, it's over with very, very quickly. And so we don't know he might survive. And uh, there's a lot of debate about this, and the mathematics of this is quite interesting, mathematical physics. Uh, but the bottom line, then, is that uh, in interstellar, Cooper hopes to learn the quantum laws from the outlying singularity and use them to save humanity. Uh, he uh, and TARS uh, make observations. They figure this out, get enough data to be able to send back to uh, Cooper's daughter uh, to try to save the human race. and then. They are carried by a vehicle that has been placed there by real bulk beings. The bulk beings were hypothetical when this began, but these are real bulk beings who are major uh, characters in the movie. Through the entire movie, they are called they, a very reverential they by the characters in the movie. And then at the very end of the movie, just once, uh, Cooper says, the bulk beings that made this, th this tesseract that made the vehicle that he's been carried in, refers to them by that name. This is, uh, this is quintessential Christopher Nolan. The secret to the key things in the movie, it's two words in this case that appear once in the movie. Uh, and if you know enough about uh, the lore of this, suddenly things start to make some sense. Oh, anyway, so uh, string theory requires that there are actually six or seven higher dimensions uh, and one could actually be large, according to speculation, informed speculations by Lisa Randall, a professor at Harvard, and Raman Sundram, a professor at the University of Maryland. And so our universe, then, uh, instead of having just three dimensions, east, west, north, south, up, down, and a fourth, which is time, has one more dimension, the out-back dimension, that leads into the bulk. Uh, and so in the movie, the characters talk many times about the fifth dimension. That's the fifth dimension. 
Uh, Cooper and Tars are rescued by a test vehicle called a tesseract, a hypercube, and they are carried through the bulk back to Earth, a distance that uh, down inside our universe it would be 10 billion light years. It's a very short distance up in the bulk. And this, again, is precise mathematics of Einstein's equations applied to this problem. A very short distance. Get back, and the tesseract docks beside Murph's bedroom. And then you see the climactic part of the movie, which I'm not going to explain. <laughs> Except to say that in my first meeting with Christopher Nolan, he said, I greatly admire Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, and particularly the mysterious ending. And I want Interstellar to have an ending that is equally mysterious, but that is explainable. And he gave to me the opportunity to explain it. And so I explain it in my book. And uh, so what I recommend is that you get the book and you go back and forth between the book <laughs> and the DVD, uh, and uh, uh, back and forth, and figure out what it is that you're seeing. Uh, wormholes, uh, I'm going to uh, flip over through wormholes very quickly. Uh, there's a wormhole in the uh, movie. It's a shortcut through the bulk to lead from the vicinity of uh, Saturn to the vicinity of Gargantua. Uh, wormholes are solutions to Einstein's equations, but there is a real concern that if you don't thread them with something called exotic matter, they will pinch off before you can travel through them. And we don't know whether or not you can, in, even the laws of physics allow you to have enough exotic matter to hold a wormhole open. Uh, and uh, so that's a challenge for physics. But we assume that, in fact, you can and do in the movie Interstellar. Uh, so although wormholes are very likely forbidden by the laws of physics, we don't not know that for sure. And so we have used wormholes in this movie. This is the actual shape of the wormhole that we used in the movie. Uh, and uh, we took then the uh, nebulae and stars of the distant galaxy as painted by uh, Eugenie von Tunzelman's artist team and propagated light from them to the IMAX camera and made this image, which is the image that you see in the movie. And then uh, we looked at what it uh, seems like if you travel through a wormhole. And uh, so here is the wormhole. It's two kilometers in diameter. Uh, this, it, this is Saturn. Saturn is very far away. The wormhole is close to you. That's why the wormhole looks so big compared to Saturn. Uh, and the light rays that come from Saturn, some go around this side of the wormhole and make that image of Saturn. Others go around the other side and make this highly distorted image of Saturn. So that explains the images. And now I'm going to show you what very few people have seen is what it really looks like to travel through this wormhole. And there's no music here, because we didn't use this in the movie for reasons I will, that will become evident. So we're getting close to the mouth of the wormhole. We're about to enter the mouth of the wormhole. We've entered it. We're going through it. We're out the other side. And wasn't that exciting? <laughs> so Christopher Nolan telephoned me uh, one day when uh, the movie had been uh, filmed and they were editing the movie and said, well, I now have the, uh, the uh, uh, computer graphics images of going through the wormhole. Here it is. What do we do? Uh, this is not, uh, not exciting enough. <laughs> and so he then showed me a number of other images of going through wormholes with other shapes. And none of them were very satisfactory. So he said, so what do we do, Kip? And I said, OK, you use artistic license. And this is the one place in the movie where then they deviated uh, from the real prediction. So I'm going to show you a clip from the movie. Uh, up until Cooper pushes the joystick to enter the wormhole, everything is precisely the way it really would be, by solving a uh, propagation of light uh, in the vicinity of the wormhole. And then at that moment, it all changes its artistic license. So, so this is the wormhole. There, you see you're up close to it. This is the spacecraft endurance. Uh, and you're seeing the stars and galaxies of the distant, uh, the stars and nebulae of the distant galaxy through the wormhole. That's them, light coming through the wormhole. Again, this is the real thing, sort of skimming along the. Uh, 
Marvel Galaxy. artistic license <laughs> so you can believe everything you see about black holes and wormholes in the movie except uh, that trip <laughs> so I'm going to conclude with five minutes about gravitational waves which is not part of interstellar but it is the most exciting thing going in uh, relativity at the present time and you're going to see a lot uh, in the newspapers about this sometime in the next four years. I can't tell you when, but sometime in the next four years. Gravitational waves were predicted by Einstein in 1916, a prediction of his Einstein equation. They are ripples in the shape of space, sort of like ripples on, the fa on, on a pond if you throw rocks into a pond. They travel at the same speed as light, and what they do physically is they stretch and squeeze you. So if they go past Miller's planet, <coughs> They will stretch Miller's planet in this direction, squeeze in that direction if they're going to the screen. Then a moment later, they will stretch horizontally and squeeze vertically, then stretch vertically and squeeze horizontally in an oscillatory sort of a way. And so that's the physical manifestation. Joseph Weber at the University of Maryland in 1958 pioneered the effort to detect these waves. Rainer Weiss, Ray Weiss at MIT, invented the technique that we now use in 1971. In 1971, I began theoretical studies of gravitational wave sources. Uh, and uh, very early in this, it, we recognized that merging, colliding black holes would produce strong gravitational waves. So uh, I had an artist make a, a conceptual diagram of what that might look like as these black holes spiral around each other, merge, and form a single black hole. And we know from the theory, uh, even before we do simulations on computers, we know that the power output in gravitational waves from one black hole merger is 10,000 times the power output from all the stars in the universe put together <coughs> from one pair of black holes. 10,000 universe luminosities. If the black holes are small, this happens quickly in a fraction of a second. And so the total energy that comes off by adding up all that power for a very short time is about uh, a few percent, up to 10 percent of the mass of the black hole. Mass and energy are equivalent, according to Einstein. If these are giant black holes like Gargantua, it will take a few hours for this light, to, uh, for, the, uh, for the gravitational waves to be emitted. And again, it's a few percent, up to 10 percent of the mass of the black hole in these gravitational waves. There are no electromagnetic waves emitted whatsoever unless there's a disk of hot gas around the black hole, like the uh, gargantuous disk, which then will be disturbed when the, uh, the black holes merge. And you may say a, see a big electromagnetic display. And so the name of the game in this business is to look for the gravitational waves, say, from two colliding black holes, merging black holes, and hope that you will also see some light, some x-rays, some gamma rays, some radio waves. So there's a collaboration between the team that has built these uh, gravitational wave detectors and the electromagnetic astronomy. We are doing simulations on supercomputers to determine the shapes of the waves that are produced by different kinds of black holes, different sizes, different masses, different spins. Each one has its own characteristic shape of the wave. What is the pattern of stretch and squeeze as time passes? We call these the waveforms. So, we are building a catalog of waveforms in a dictionary to interpret the waves from the computer simulations. So that once we see the waves, we will know just what kinds of black holes we're doing this. We'll also know how far away they are, approximately where they are in the sky, and how space-time is behaving during this collision, warped space-time is behaving. The instruments that we are using are called laser interferometer gravity wave detectors. Uh, and, uh, they consist of mirrors that hang by from overhead supports that weigh 40 kilograms, about 100 pounds. And they are pushed back and forth, stretched apart along this arm, squeezed together along that arm. The next half cycle, stretched apart and squeezed together. We use laser beams to monitor that stretching and squeezing through what's called laser interferometry. The separation between these mirrors is four kilometers. 
the mirrors are moved by the gravitational waves, say, from two colliding black holes by an amount that is uh, at maximum one one thousandth the diameter of a proton or of the nucleus of an atom. And just to remind you, the nucleus of an atom or a proton is a hundred thousand times smaller than the atom. So this is one one thousandth of a hundred thousandth the size of an atom. And this superb team of experimenters has built an instrument that can measure this and monitor and look for these gravitational waves. This is a collaboration of 900 scientists at 75 institutions in 15 nations. These are the nations. The uh, director currently is David Reitsey at Caltech, Gabriel, Gabriela Gonzalez at the Louisiana State University is the spokesperson for the collaboration. This is a picture of one of these uh, gravity wave detectors out in the desert in, uh, uh, near Hanford, Washington. There's a network of such detectors around the world. We need a network to be sure that what we see is the real thing, to extract the waveform, determine the direction of the source by the time delay and the arrival of the signal at different locations. Uh, we uh, proposed originally to build these uh, detectors in two generations. The first generation that would not, probably not be good enough to see waves, but we would perfect the technology. And then an advanced set of detectors uh, that should see lots of waves. These advanced detectors began their first gravitational search, well, it's now two months ago. Uh, I originally made this slide for Taiwan. It's now two months ago. They are operating with sensitivities good enough to see colliding 10 solar mass black holes out to a billion light years, which is a tenth of the way to the edge of the observable universe, which is rather impressive. Uh, over the next four years, we will improve them until they can see to four billion light years, or a third of the way to the edge of the observable universe. At that distance, they are likely to see lots of colliding black holes, neutron stars, and engines of gamma ray bursts, and there may be very big surprises. This is likely to produce a revolution in our understanding of the universe, and it's going to come, I'm quite confident, in the next four years. This is just for physicists or engineers, just to indicate this is a so-called noise curve. The noise in, the, uh, in these instruments plotted upward as a function of frequency. What I want to flag is that the initial detectors, which were where we got our, the team got its feet wet learning how to do this, uh, were three times better in the distance we can see uh, at the uh, optimal frequency, 150 hertz for these waves, 30 times better up near 1,000 hertz a thousand times better down near 30 hertz. Uh, and so enormous improvements over the first generation. And we are at a point where binary black holes, a tenth of the way to the edge of the uni observable universe, can be seen today in the search that is now going on. So this is a very exciting time. We are on the verge of revolutionizing our understanding of the universe with gravitational waves. So I just want to conclude by saying that General relativity, the first 100 years, and I've just sketched a little bit of it, it has been absolutely amazing. Thank you. I thought that was a pizza box. Sorry to disappoint you, it's not a pizza box. But it is a plaque uh, honoring uh, your lecture, your previous lecture, and all of the other uh, distinguished Smith's lectures in the series. Thank you. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. So let me just say it's a real honor to have been able to give the Smith Lecture twice, and a particular honor to have so many enthusiastic people here. Thank you, everybody.